I don't always understand why people get sick, why people have problems. But one thing I know, God is committed to your sanctification. God will sacrifice your physical comfort for the sake of your spiritual character. God's greatest gift is good news that will bring you great joy because it solves our greatest need for forgiveness. So three important traits that I want you to learn about God. Number one, everybody say God's sovereignty. Say that with me. God's sovereignty. Number two, God's faithfulness. And number three, God's greatest gift. Number one. God's sovereignty. What does it mean? Well, do you want to know the meaning of the word sovereign? Okay, let's look at how that concept is used by the writer. Let's begin. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the census be taken out of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinus was governor of Syria. Our amazing historian, Dr. Luke, mentioned two names, Caesar Augustus and Quirinus. Why? It is to show us Christmas is real. It is historical. It is not a figment of imagination. Now, who is Caesar Augustus? Now, when you just read the Bible, you will pass over these verses quickly. You will have no idea why is Saint Luke, why is the historian Luke writing about Caesar Augustus and a census and about the decree. What is so important? It is very important. You know why? Let's read the next verse. Everybody, everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary. The decree is used for taxation purposes. Remember, Caesar Augustus was developing a massive army, census to recruit how many men are able to fight. So, that's human purpose. But what is a divine purpose? The divine purpose, you begin to see that God is in control, even a pagan emperor, to accomplish his purpose. Somebody said, Caesar Augustus accomplished many things, okay? For example, Pax Romana, peace, road system. This guy built 50,000 miles of road, 50,000. To go from here to the States is around 6,000 plus miles. He built 50,000 miles. For the first 300 years, Rome built, believe it or not, 250,000 miles of road system. Why? Sure. The Roman emperor has his own ideas to connect cities to places, but God has a purpose. You know what's God's purpose by that decree? Because of this important word, Bethlehem. Because God is sovereign. And God made a prophecy that the coming Messiah has got to be born in Quezon City. Uh Not Quezon City. It has to be born in New York City. No, 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 no. It has to be born in Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem comes literally from the house of bread. Beth, house, Lehem, the house of bread, the source of life. And that is the city of David. Why? Because of this important word, Joseph. You see, God made a prophecy. For you to know who is going to be the Messiah, He must come from the descendant of David. But that Messiah has got to be born where? Bethlehem. Now, listen to me. If you were Mary, 
If you were Joseph, are you happy because of this decree? Wow, they are living in Galilee, Nazareth, and now they have to go all the way down to Bethlehem. Now, be honest. Will you be happy or will you be sad? You see, friends, you must understand the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God does not always mean everything that happens to you will be nice. But God's purpose will be accomplished. But you notice about Mary and Joseph. Joseph was a good leader. He obeys the law. When the law says you register, he was able to convince his wife. And Mary was a very submissive wife. Even though they are not yet married, but they're engaged. Engaged means what? Almost married. So they went there. Now read the next verse. What happened? This is what happened. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Underline the word completed. In other words, God's timing is amazing. You've got to understand, God is sovereign. He controls even pagan kings to accomplish his purpose. But God is faithful. He keeps his promises. The Messiah will have to be born in Bethlehem. Let's read. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. No room. Friends, let me ask you a question. Think about this. If the decree came earlier, where will Jesus be born? You are staying in Galilee, so you go down, you register, and you go back. So where will the Messiah be born? Galilee. If the decree came later, where will the Messiah be born? Galilee. Understand? Because the baby came out and the decree came. How long does it take for the decree to reach the ears of Joseph? How long? There's no internet. There's no CNN. There's no ABS-CBN. So, how would they know? Ah, my friend, this is the amazing thing about the sovereignty of God. Sometimes, a scholar tells us it takes months for a decree to reach a particular place. What I'm trying to say is simply this. God is in control. Over every area of your life, you may know it, you may not know it, but that's not the point. The point is, God is sovereign. Please say that with me. God is sovereign. He is in control. Control to do what? God is in control to accomplish His purpose. God is faithful. When He promised something, He will do it. Because God's timing is perfect. When the Bible says God is sovereign, just a simple perspective, so you will learn to be happy and rejoicing and be at peace. Here's the definition of God's sovereignty. Number one, He is the most high, Lord of heaven and earth. Number two, subject to none, absolutely independent, accountable to none. What does that mean? God does not report to anybody. Unlike you, unlike me. All of us are always reporting under somebody. Even the U.S. president is accountable to the Congress, accountable to the people. But God, look, subject to none, absolutely independent. You cannot force God to do anything. Accountable to none. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases. You cannot force God. Nobody forced God to send Jesus. Christmas was never extracted, forced by people to send a Savior. No, no. It's God's own free will. He is sovereign. None can hinder him, including the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. Look at what Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, he said the following. Everybody read. There is no attribute more comforting than the sovereignty of God. The world do not like the sovereignty of God. The secular world do not like God to be in control. 
The secular world wants God to be a Santa Claus. We, they don't mind God being a provider. They don't mind God being a bestower of blessings. But to say that God is king, he is sovereign, that he has every right to do as he pleases, when he pleases, without asking your permission, that is something the world does not like. But you know what? To me, it's a great comfort. Why? Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, and sovereignty overrules them, and sovereignty will sanctify them all. No attribute more humbling for us to accept than God is sovereign, and we are responsible to Him. Friend, this has comforted my life. When bad things happen to our family, and many of you know the story, when bad things happen to our family business, you all know the story, but you know what? God reminded us, reminded me, I'm in control. I will trust Him, because God is faithful. What do we mean, God is faithful? The idea of faithfulness means God is completely dependable, all right? Completely dependable. For example, look at Numbers 23, verse 19. Let's read that together. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not make good? So to understand the faithfulness of God, you now contrast that with the faithfulness of men. You see, men, sorry, but the truth is, many men, I'm not saying women are exempted, but many men are not faithful. I've seen this in marriages. Many couples, now I will include the women, we make promises. I'll be faithful in good times, in bad times. I will not leave you. I will not desert you. Those are nice promises. But I can almost predict, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, more than 50% of you will raise your hand that your family has been broken in the past. I've seen many CCFers. My heart goes out for you. I look at your past, broken homes. Why? Because your parents did not keep their vows. They separated, they divorced. But God is different. When God gives you a promise, listen to me, He will keep His word. That's the beauty of God. Amen? Is God faithful? Yes, God is very faithful. For example, when I say God is very faithful, all right, here are examples of God's promises. I'll give you seven. Okay, that has to do with Jesus. These are God's promises. God says, I promise you a Savior, all right, in the book of Genesis chapter 3. A Savior would be a human, the seed of a woman, not an angel. God made a promise to Adam. God made a promise to Abraham. In your seed, the Messiah will come. So, the Messiah will be Jewish. God made a promise to Jacob, the one of your descendants, especially the tribe of Judah, the Messiah will come from. God kept his word because Judah, after Judah, you have the family of David. So God made a promise that the Messiah will come from the family line of David, except there's a problem. God made a curse. The curse is to the descendant of David, Jeconiah. What is that curse? Look at God's predicament. David, the future Messiah, will come from your seed. But then one of the descendants of David, the king, was Jeconiah. And God says, because of your sin, not one of your descendants will ever sit on the throne again. That's a problem. I promise to David. How will God fulfill his commitment to David and his curse to Jeconiah? I want to show you the amazing accuracy of the Word of God. Let's look 
at the verse referring to 2 Samuel and Jeremiah. 2 Samuel, God's promise to David. When your days are complete and you die with your fathers, I will raise up a descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Scholars call this the Davidic covenant. God made a unilateral promise to David. The Messiah will come from your seed. His kingdom will be forever. Wow, how can that ever happen? And then, years later, one of the descendants of David, King Jeconiah, hey, problematic boy. Thus says the Lord in Jeremiah, when right this man childless, King Jeconiah, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling over Judah. Do you see that predicament? God promised David the Messiah will come from your family line. At the same time, the kingly line of David, Jeconiah, God made a curse. So how was that fulfilled? All right, I want you to look at the genealogy of Jesus. How when God says something, he will do it. When God makes a curse, it shall be done. When God gives you a warning, you better listen. Because the good and the bad will happen. So take God's faithfulness seriously. He keeps his word. In the genealogy of Jesus, in Luke chapter 3, notice the son of Nathan, the son of David. Suddenly, the line of David is split into two, Nathan and Solomon. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, David was the father of Solomon. You see, Matthew chapter 1 described the kingly line of Jesus. And Matthew chapter 1 talks about Joseph. However, in Luke chapter 2, the genealogy is to Mary. But if you just read the Bible, you will not notice it. So, both Mary and Joseph were descendants of King David. One from Solomon, the kingly line, Joseph. But Joseph was not the blood father of David. He was only the adopted father. Mary was the blood mother of Jesus because God promised David. You see what I'm saying now? So you have the son of Nathan, the son of David. This is the bloodline of Mary. The bloodline of Jesus is the kingly line, but not bloodline. It's the kingly line. Matthew. Let's go back to that prophecy again. So, all the seven prophecies, I want you to notice the Messiah will be born of a virgin. That's Mary. Born in Bethlehem, Micah. Many times, we fail to understand what the Bible is telling us when it comes to God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness is so true that the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. You know, many times I am not faithful, but God is faithful. Do you realize in God's faithfulness, he may cause things that you don't like to happen to you? Psalm 119, verse 75. God is sovereign. I'm sure Mary and Joseph did not enjoy that long, long walk or long ride, whatever it is. Let's read this together. I know, O Lord, that you, that your judgments are right, and that, everybody read, in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. I don't always understand why people get sick, why people have problems, but one thing I know, God is committed to your sanctification. God is committed for you to become a better person. And I always say this again and again. God will sacrifice your physical comfort for the sake 
of your spiritual character. Think about it. Some of you are having a problem now. This Christmas, I hope we remind you that God is sovereign. God is in control, and God is faithful. He wants what's good for you. You may not see it, but God will keep his promises. Question, are there any promises you are claiming? Can I tell you some of the promises I'm claiming? Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all, all of these things, food, clothing, shelter, all your basic needs, God says, I will provide. So don't worry. God is saying, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Romans 8.28. Have you memorized Romans 8.28? Okay, let's make sure you read this properly and memorize it together with me. We know God causes all things to work together for good. For good. To those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. Notice the promise of God. Everything that happens to you. God causes all things to work together for good. Condition to those who love Him. To those who are called according to His purpose. You know, I always tell people, you know, years ago, I remember when we went to the Holy Land and to the Middle East, somebody was selling carpets, right? Now, this is not the exact carpet I want to show you, but I want to show you something. Is this carpet beautiful or no? Nice or no? Honestly, when I look at this kind of carpet, I said, it's so ugly. And then the owner said, sir, you are looking it at the wrong side. Oh, oh wrong side. Okay. Is this nicer? You know, when you look at life, many times you look at it on the wrong side. You got to see it at the right side. God's perspective, not your perspective. See, right now, what's happening to you may be bad. It may not be nice problem of my parents, broken homes. How come I have all kinds of problems? Health problems, physical problems. But then someday, I guarantee you, when you go to heaven and you look back, what will you see? You see, friends, my faith is not in circumstances. I've gone through life I've seen all kinds of problems. I've gone through all kinds of problems. Ups and downs. But as I look back at what has happened to me, and someday, when I reach heaven, I will guarantee you one thing. It's going to be beautiful. Amen? That is the message of Christmas. But you will never experience the true meaning of Christmas until you understand what I promised to tell you about God's greatest gift. You know, God gave Jesus three titles. Look at Luke 2, verse 10 and 11. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Notice, great joy for all the people. Mega kara, mega grace. Today, today, historical. In the city of David, there has been born for you. Okay, what are the three titles of Jesus? Let's look at it. One is called Savior, Christ the Lord. Jesus is Savior, Rescuer. Now, why did God give us a Savior? You will never appreciate God's gift until you understand your problem. A Savior means what? We need saving. We have a problem. Notice the next word, Christ. Not just any ordinary Savior. It is the promised Messiah. The word Christ is literally means what? In the Hebrew word, Messiah. Messiah. Anointed one. The chosen one of God. Anybody can claim to be the Messiah. But how many are from the seed of David? Abraham, born in Bethlehem. Huh? Only one. Jesus. And Lord. Now, the word Lord... In the Greek language, some people will say, well, it simply means you are the master. No, no, no. In the Bible, that Greek word, Lord, is curious. We have another word for Lord, despot. 
But in Jesus, that word Kyrios was used to translate the Old Testament, referring to Yahweh. So this word Kyrios, used in the New Testament, is also used to translate the Old Testament, God, his name is Kyrios. In other words, Jesus is not just a man. He is what? He is God. The divinity of our Savior is God's Son, God Himself. My friend, you will never appreciate God's gift until you know why you need a Savior. Let me give you some verses so that you will know why you need to understand Christmas. A Messiah, why you need a Savior. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, everybody read, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody, the word sin means what? Self-will against the will of God. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible is very emphatic. What is sin? All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Everybody read, each of us has turned to his own way. So what is sin? Look at me. Sin is self-will against the will of God. It's called rebellion against God. Every time you disobey the Ten Commandments, you know what you are saying? I don't care. I am my boss. All of us have sinned. What's wrong with sin? Well, you will not appreciate you need a Savior until you know the consequences of sin. Let's read the next verse. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Now, let's talk about the wages of sin is death. I memorized this in the Galog. In Tagalog. Ang kabayaran ng kasalanan ay kamatayan. Now, the Bible talks about two kinds of death. People don't understand this. For sure, you will die. Hebrews 9.27. Let's read that together. Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto men to die how many times? Once. After this, judgment. That's called physical death. The word death in the Greek language does not mean cessation of life. It does not mean cessation of activities. No, no, no. The word death simply means separation. When you die physically, your body is separated from your soul. Your spirit lives. So you go to a casket, you go to a morgue, you see the body, but the spirit is no longer there. That's physical death. What is spiritual death? The Bible talks about another kind of death. Example. Let's read. The book of Revelation. Together, everybody. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death, Hades, gave up the dead which were in them. They were judged, everyone according to their deeds. Remember judgment. After you die, judgment. You don't cease to exist. You still exist. Except what is physical, what is spiritual death? Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. A spiritual death is when you are separated eternally from the very presence of God. Physical death, when your spirit is separated from your body. A spiritual death, when you are eternally separated from God. And that place is called the lake of of fire. It is so horrible. Revelation chapter 21 repeats it. Let's read this together. Everybody read. Cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderous. Everybody read. Immoral person, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. By the way, how many of you have lied? Raise your hands. Higher, higher. We problem at All liars. What does it say? And all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The second death. Friends, why am I sharing this with you? You know, with all my heart, I care for people. With all my heart, I really believe there are only two places where you will go after you die. God is faithful. When he gives a warning, you better listen. For example, 
This warning is repeated again and again, even in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to read this. What does it mean, second death? Everybody read. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. In other words, don't fool yourself. Guys, in my experience, you know, when people don't like something, when they don't like what the Bible is saying, these are the options. Number one, they just deceive themselves. They, they just deny it. They don't want to think about it. That's one option. You can deny it. It's up to you. You can deceive yourself. It's up to you. Or you can delay your own action. Well, let me think about it. But you know what? Look at the warning. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, louder, adulterers, effeminate, nor louder, homosexuals. I'm not the one saying it. I'm not being politically correct. I'm just being politically honest. The Bible says, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. Everybody read? Will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. The good news is the next verse. Look at the good news. Such were some of you. You know, I look at my life. I am dead. I am guilty of sin. But such were some of you. But, everybody read, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. Declared not guilty. Wow! How can that be? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, Christmas is God's amazing gift. You can believe it, accept it, or don't do anything about it. The choice is yours. To accept God's gift, you must recognize Jesus, not just Savior, but Lord. Lord means what? The King of Kings. Absolute surrender. Absolute ownership of everything. Jesus, our Savior, is going to come again. God gives a promise. He will keep it. He came the first time as Savior. He promised He's coming again to reward and to judge you and to judge me. Are you ready for Jesus? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I need you. I admit that without you, I can never go to heaven. I accept you today. I receive your gift. Lord, the greatest gift, which is your son, Jesus. Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Come into my life. Today, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Make this Christmas meaningful to me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming and for dying on the cross to pay for all of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the full penalty of my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Now, to those of you who have Jesus already, I want you to go and tell others. You know why you should tell others? If you really believe Jesus is the way, you should not keep that to yourself. This is the best time to talk about Jesus. Nobody will get angry at you. You know why? It is the reason of Christmas. So will you commit to tell others about Jesus? Praise God. Let me close with this blessing for all of you, all right? Let's all stand up as I pray a blessing for all of you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this message that you want us to share the good news. Lord, the good news means what? Evangelism. You want us to share the good news because it will bring us great joy. 
the joy of Christmas. So Lord, I pray for all of us that we will have the opportunity, we will have the privilege of sharing this amazing truth, amazing gospel, the good news with our friends, with our loved ones. Even right now, Lord, speak to our minds. Show us which person we need to share with. Reveal to us as we pray right now. Family members, friends, I don't know who, Lord, but can you please speak to all of your people right now? And help us to be obedient in sharing the good news. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless.